Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Thank you very much, Jack. I was looking around behind me to see who you were talking about there for a minute. <clears throat> My name is Betty I'm an alcoholic, and I'm a member of the Brooklyn Heights Group of Alcoholics Anonymous. Um, and for me, that's a very, very important thing, because as long as I'm a member of a group of Alcoholics Anonymous, I'm going to be all right. Um, I want to thank the committee for asking me and for asking other people at GSO to come here to the Blue Ridge Mountains and share with you. I, I got a lot of good advice, not advice, but a lot of good sharing about what a wonderful weekend this is and what a wonderful time I was going to have. And I can see that it, that it was all very authentic because it's a beautiful place and uh, I've had a good time already. Um, I'd like to tell you some tonight uh, about how it was, what happened, and how I got here. Um, I was born in 1928 into an Irish Catholic family in the Bronx, New York. And uh, when I came to AA in uh, 1963, they told me that I didn't have to be an Irish Catholic to join this club, but that it would help. Uh, there's another one in the crowd. <laughs> there were a lot of us there in Northport. And uh, at any rate, my grandfather, my paternal grandfather, died of alcoholism in Bellevue Hospital before I was born. And that was before there was any such thing as Alcoholics Anonymous. And uh, I always say, unfortunately, he was the one with the money uh, because he, had, he was a very successful contractor in the city of New York. And when we were very small, my father took us and showed us buildings with a little name in them uh, carved into the stone because he was a stone cutter. But he died of pauper in the DTs in Bellevue Hospital. Um, my my mother's father um, was, I guess, I suppose, a heavy drinker. But my mother, because of that, was terrified of alcohol. And uh, he worked for the newspapers. He was a stationary engineer. And he worked nights. And when he came home in the morning, when I was a child, he would go into the closet, literally, and have a couple of shots of Park and Pilford. And uh, I know that when he came out of the closet, he, um, he his personality changed. And my mother told us stories about when she was young and the engineer's ball came and how they all got drunk and how terrified she was. And when I was nine years old, my mother forbade me to drink. Now, I, I hadn't thought of it yet, but I can tell you that it made me very interested in the idea. <laughs> and... Uh, <laughs> When I was 14, I went to a Christmas party, and somebody's mother gave us a drink, and I loved everything about it. When I was 14 years old, I was equally as large as I am now, and uh, a little bit taller. We were talking about uh, osteoporosis at the table. I was a little taller than I am now. And I took this drink, and I'm here to tell you that life changed instantly. I got shorter, I got prettier, you know, and all my awkwardness with myself seemed to change almost immediately, and I really loved it. Uh, I lived at home. I didn't drink a great deal in my teens, but I certainly drank whenever I got the opportunity. Um, and I found early on that I had a large capacity for alcohol. Um, Ours was a matriarchal home. I came from, I remember the first time I heard Bill Wilson. He said, we are all a result of a parental relationship gone wrong, either too much attention or too little attention. But the psychological name for the disease of alcoholism is one of dependency. And my life was uh, in a home where there was too much attention. Uh, I think that we had a babysitter when we were kids twice. You know, and I can remember who it was, because my mother rarely let us out of her sight, and especially me, because somehow or another they became very aware that I was rebellious. And so the control 
uh, was even stronger with me. Uh, however, I did drink in my teens, and I did this sufficiently to discover that I had a very large capacity. And as I grew up and got out of high school, uh, and I went to work in New York City, we lived in a, and they moved from the Bronx when I was an infant to a little town outside New York in the suburbs called Floral Park. And, um, but I commuted to the city to go to work, and I uh, quickly found out about lunchtime cocktails. And I found out about bars, which were also forbidden, and I loved bars. They were forbidden, after all. That made them marvelous to start with. And, uh, and I liked bartenders, and I liked the mirrors, and I liked the whole thing. Um, at any rate, uh, in, in through the teen years in my early adulthood, there was the control, and uh, I didn't get into a great deal of trouble. Uh, when I was about 22 years old, I was working for a chemical company, and uh, there was a strike. And as a result, we did a huge amount of overtime, and I collected a good amount of money. And finally, I got my vacation, and I took this money and went off to the Pocono Mountains. And that's uh, where young secretaries would go for vacation in the Northeast. And we did something known at that time as operating. And uh, I went to the Pocono Mountains, and I met someone at the table. There was a, another young woman around my age at the table uh, the first night I was there, and she was from the Bronx. And uh, we went downstairs, and we met some other guys, and, and off we went to a speakeasy in Pennsylvania. We had a marvelous time. And I drank my way through that vacation, and with no ill effects, because I was young and healthy. And uh, when we returned to New York, this friend who worked in Rockefeller Center, as I did, said, I know a bar on 44th Street that you might like, and maybe we could get together one time and go there. And so about a week or two after we returned to New York, I met this newfound friend, and we went to the bar on 44th Street, and I liked it so much that seven years later I was getting mail there, telephone calls there, um, <laughs> Went on for a long, long time, my drinking in that bar. Um, I was working for an ad I guess I left the, the chemical company and went to work for an advertising agency along the way. I was already introduced to the bar. And uh, there were a lot of people in publishing. And by the time I left the advertising agency, it was now three, four, five years later, to go to work for a news magazine, uh, when I went for the interview with the news magazine, I had to have a vodka gimlet in order to go on the interview. Now, a lot of things happened along the way. Any relationship that I started fell apart because my primary relationship more and more and more and more had to do with alcohol. Any anxiety that I had, and I had a great deal of it from the time I was very young, I suffered from anxiety. And I found as soon as I started to drink that all of my anxiety was soluble in alcohol. What I didn't understand when I was suffering from the anxiety was something I came to understand when I came to Alcoholics Anonymous. And that's that what the, the name of my fear was self-centered fear. And the alcohol, of course, only made that worse. It made me crawl further and further and further into myself. And the more, of course, that I did this, the worse the anxiety became and the more I needed to drink, and it is like a squirrel cage. And it went on and on and on. Um, the, the job with the news magazine was a very, very good job. Uh, and I had not had a college education, and I was doing very well. I was supervising the secretaries of all the salesmen, and I believe there were something like 14 of them, and they all had expense accounts, and they were all very heavy drinkers. And whenever they wanted to solve a problem about the secretarial support system that they had, they knew what to do. They invited me out for drinks. I also had charge of the box in Yankee Stadium, and which the salesmen used to entertain customers. And the salesman knew how to get the box in Yankee Stadium on the good days. They took me out for drinks. And uh, my drinking during that period really accelerated in that two years. And I can remember that I would close up the desk. And uh, one night in particular, I can remember it as if it was yesterday, 
And I slammed the desk door shut, and I stuffed all the papers in, and I said, I'll do this tomorrow and that tomorrow, you know. And a little voice inside of me said, you know very well you don't know whether you're going to get here tomorrow or not. Because by this time, alcohol had total control of my life, and it decided whether I went to work in the morning, it decided whether I got there on time or whether I got there late, it decided who I was with, it decided where I was with. Uh, with whom uh, and I shrugged that thought off like it was a cobweb in my mind and locked the desk door and walked out of that office and walked up the street and turned left and turned right and went right into that bar and I didn't get there the next day because I had absolutely no control over what happened to me when I picked up the first drink uh, I didn't understand that then. I wasn't able to relate that, to, uh, you know, the two events. Uh, I didn't know that when I took the first drink, there was absolutely no choice for me about the second, third, fourth, fifth, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I was fired from the job at Newsweek. Uh, it was a very good job, and they told me the day they fired me that I had been considered the secretary to the chairman of the board. And it really would have been making it for me, considering my educational background. But instead, I was on the street, and I was something like uh, 31, 32 years old, and I went on a one-week vendor. And my friends, uh, most of whom by now were friends from the bar room, uh, friends who drank, because if you didn't drink, I just didn't make friends with you. Uh, and they were passing me from one to the other, they were concerned about me because I seemed to have lost all control over my emotions. But what did they do? They kept buying me drinks. Because of these people were this, many of them have died since from alcohol and from alcoholism. Uh, but I remember that week and it just went on and on and on. And finally I just had to stay home for several days and taper down and uh, get control of myself, which I was able to do when I was drinking, but I had to literally close out the world and stay home and eat a little and sleep a little and drink a little until I was able to stop the drinking for a while and uh, settle my stomach down and get some kind of water into my life. And I did this and got uh, yet another job. And it was one job after another job after another job, and they were lesser and lesser and lesser. I became totally incapable of maintaining relationships with men or women uh, because I was like, uh, I, I had a friend who was an artist, and I remember she said to me, if I were to paint you, I would paint a great big crying child uh, and because literally alcohol was reducing me uh, to a vegetable. I was uh, gradually less and less able to look after my appearance. Uh, I gained weight upon weight upon weight. Uh, my clothing was always in, uh, in, in a state of uh, disorder. There were either cigarette burns or split seams or whatever. And I used to joke about putting the stockings on and to get the runs on straight. Uh, it, was, it was a perfectly dreadful state of affairs. And I think it's one that every alcoholic in this room... Uh, Understands. If you understand it, I don't have to explain it to you. And if you don't, I can't. Uh, it's literally one of those things. Uh, someplace along the line, I left home. At age 27, I ran away from home. Um, speaking of the parental relationship. And literally, I had to climb over the screaming body. Needless to say, uh, when I left home, the drinking accelerated. Uh, there was no control over me now. And needless to say, when the drinking accelerated totally out of control, the anxiety got worse. Someplace along the line there, I decided that I needed to go to the therapy. I, I entered psychotherapy. And I remember that at that time, it's got to have been um, in the 1950s, uh, I was paying something like $25 an hour. And I was going to this guy two or three times a week. And I remember somebody telling me a joke in the bar about a guy who went to a psychiatrist 
And when asked what his problem was, he told the psychiatrist that he lived in Greenwich, Connecticut with his wife and two kids, and that he traveled on business once in a while to Chicago, uh, and he had a girlfriend there, and he had her in an apartment on the lake. And uh, the psychiatrist finally said, well, what is the problem? This all sounds very nice to me. And he said, well, you see, I only make $85 a week. <laughs> now, I laughed at this, but I was going to the psychiatrist a couple of times a week, and I was only making $85 a week, you know, and I was drinking in the bar every day, and it didn't add up. I got a second job with someone who, uh, various people I'd meet in the bar, and I would do second jobs. Uh, one of them I remember uh, that I researched uh, the subject matter for John Nagy, who did learn how to draw television shows. And uh, I would, in order to do it very quickly and get the money, because you had to get very condensed information, it was a 15 minute show. I used to go into the children's library in the New York Public Library and sit with my knees under my nose on the little chairs, you know, and get uh, pertinent information on the various subjects. But John Nagy also bought me drinks. I did not get involved with anybody unless there was drinking involved. Uh, and uh, all of the second job money that uh, I would get went to the uh, to the bartender, and it went on the drinking, and it went on all the expenses attendant to drinking. Um, finally, I went home. Uh, I used to go home on weekends, and uh, I treated my parents' home at that time like a filling station. You know, I ate good, and I slept a lot, and I got caught up on everything so I could come back into the city and start the whole merry-go-round again. But at any rate, my mother became very ill, and this was in the early 1960s, and um, uh, I went home this Friday after the operation, and my sister told me that uh, my mother had, had terminal cancer. And I remember that my sister and I drank a fifth of gin in a couple of hours that night. And I remember my brother-in-law having to bring me back to the to the apartment and uh, help me get up these stairs. Uh, and that's just not a normal way for two women in their 30s to respond to the fact that their mother is dying. Uh, but it seemed like a perfectly normal state of affairs to me. Um, by this time, I don't know how many jobs I had lost. The psychiatrist, of course, had long since gone down the drain because I didn't pay him. Uh, the telephone had gone down the drain because I hadn't paid it. And I remember I uh, very uh, heroically offered to come home and take care of my mother. I know today that I wanted to come home to be taken care of, but I was much too proud to admit that. So here was my opportunity now to say, uh, I will come home and take care of mom. Uh, and they said yes, uh, they, uh, they wanted me to do that. And so I closed up the apartment. The gas and electric was turned off a week ahead, and it was not a misunderstanding about when I was moving. It, too, was turned off because of the non-payment of bills. So you can see how capable I was of just taking care of myself and looking after my affairs. At any rate, I went home, and I did for a period of, uh, I don't remember, six months or so. I took care of my mother until she died. And uh, my drinking really decreased. I drank little or not at all while I was doing this, uh, simply because it was not permitted in my mother's house. Uh, once in a while, we had a drink before dinner, but my sister would come every other week or so, and I would go into the city overnight, and I would get very drunk. And then I would return until the task was over, and my mother did die. And I stayed on out in Long Island and kept house for my father for a period of about 18 months. Um, when my mother was sick, he was terrified that I would leave. He was a very dependent man. And uh, I did stay and keep house for him. But the bottle that was under the sink that we didn't want my mother to know was there came out on top of the sink after she died. And I suggested to my father that we have a cocktail before dinner because now I was in charge of this household, and he agreed very readily. By the time my father was put in a nursing home, he was drinking almost a fifth a day, uh, because he uh, joined me in my drinking, literally. Uh, for years I suffered some guilt about that, until I entered psychotherapy myself, and over a period of time when we talked about it, it was pointed out to me 
that my father had the psychological disease of alcoholism, and when my mother died, the lid was just off it. You know, it was always there. And um, and that, indeed, it probably would have blossomed with or without my help. But at any rate, this is the only time I hid bottles, and I hid them from my father so that he wouldn't drink them. And I suspect he hid a few from me for the same reason. Um, and uh, I got jobs on Long Island now. And I was driving while drinking. And I got into automobile accidents, which uh, one in particular, both cars were demolished and the other one was parked. Uh, I was pulled out of that wreckage and they put stitches in my knee and in my lip in the firehouse. And I can still remember the face of the fireman who held my hands and, uh, uh, and, and because they couldn't anesthetize me. I was too drunk. And they knew I was too drunk. And it would have been too dangerous to give me any anesthetic. I really didn't need any anesthetic. It was too on. But uh, I was kind of sober by the time they got finished with that. And uh, I went back to the doctor over a period of time. And when he discharged me after taking all the stitches out, he said to me, I, you're all patched up now until the next time. And I said, uh, there isn't going to be a next time. And he said, very arrogantly. And he said, well, young lady, I hope so. But he said, I can tell you that when I arrived at the scene of that accident, I thought they had called the wrong person. I thought they should have called Tom Dalton. And Tom Dalton in that town was the undertaker. Uh, he said, you are a very fortunate woman. And uh, if you mix drinking and driving again, um, you, you're, you're really playing Russian roulette. Um, this incident interfered with my driving um, for a short period of time. Um, and it goes on and on, and it got worse and worse. Uh, and I get, came further and further and further into myself. Um, and uh, there were arguments with my brother and my sister. Uh, my sister was drinking, it was clear, was uh, running a second to mine. Uh, my brother finally didn't want me in his house at all. Um, and I was, I built resentments that it took me years to unload. Uh, because I felt like I was such a heroine for taking care of my father. Uh, my father had many strokes over a period, this period of time, and the doctor came with one of them, and I had been called at work, and I jumped in the car, and I got the call right after lunch, and I had had a couple of Manhattans, and, uh, and I drove home the 30 miles, and, uh, the doctor looked at me when I got home, and, uh, Within a few days, he talked with my brother and suggested that my father be put in a rest home. Um, I did this. I remember drinking in the morning in order to do it. It was one of the most painful experiences of my life. Um, and I remember taking 10 days to break up the apartment. I remember when the Salvation Army people came, I had had about seven drinks. Now, usually I felt desperately awful. And I was in another state of despair. But you know, when you've had about 67 drinks, things start to look better, and you know that the ship is going to come in next year, you know. And uh, it's that little space in there where you float. And um, the Salvation Army arrived just about that time. And I had a couple of winter coats, and they were very old and, and tattered. Uh, I hadn't bought anything new in a long time. But I knew when these guys came that I was going to be well off by next winter, so I gave them the winter coats. I should give them to the poor, you know. And uh, and they took the pieces of furniture and so on. And uh, it was a 10-day drunk. And I finally moved into this furnished room in Massapequa where I did my last um, mile of drinking. And, and it was a very, very desperate state of affairs. There were very few, if any, friends. And... Uh, and I remember on, on one occasion, um, um, I, I've just returned from a lovely vacation in Florida. And, and that year, a friend of mine in Florida Park, who I'd gone to school with, had been widowed. It was a fairly early widowhood. And she wanted to go out to Greenport, which is a lovely beach community on Long Island, for a week. And she wanted me to come with her. And she said, I know you're kind of broke. 
but uh, I'll pay for it. And I didn't have enough money to buy a bathing suit to go. And so I said no, and I stayed there in the furnace room and dined. Uh, finally, I was reduced to a uh, temporary job. And I would get, you know, 15 or 20 dollars. And I'd get some food, some cheap food, and, and I'd get a bottle, and I was still into, uh, the pills that I had, uh, started taking in my late 20s for anxiety. And now I was balancing the pills and the booze. Uh, I, the first thing I got into was dead people. I was still living home, I remember. And after uh, an anxiety attack on a Fifth Avenue bus, I went home and was taken to the doctor, and I was very shaky, and he uh, prescribed this Desbutol. Desbutol has dexedrine in it and a butol in it, and so it pets you up and it calms you down simultaneously. <laughs> and uh, the result was you could cross Fifth Avenue at 42nd Street in Manhattan against the light and not worry, you know. <laughs> um, it was incredible. Uh, also, the dexedrine, I found out, I took the stuff compulsively to get through a work day uh, after staying out until 4 in the morning drinking. Uh, and the result was you shook and you didn't care. I mean, normally, you know, if I had the shakes, I'd be talking to you and I'd be holding my hands behind my back. But, you know, I'd be changing typewriter ribbons and my hands were flapping all over the place. And you just didn't care. Uh, it, it, I call them green happiness pills. And over the years, I went from them to almost anything, to Milltown, to uh, somebody I knew took Thorazine. And we used to swap pills at the bar. I mean, uh, it was just insanity when I, when, when I learned what I'd learned uh, uh, about what happens when we cross uh, medication and alcohol, medication of that time. Uh, but there I was uh, now in the furnished room, and I'd get a few dollars, and I wouldn't know whether to buy the pills or a bottle, and I'd get a half a pint and a prescription. I had, in those days, you could keep a prescription operating in more than one drugstore at one time, and I knew how to do that. And uh, uh, that was going on. Uh, but I was in a truly desperate state of affairs by now, and uh, I got up out of the convertible sofa I slept in in that furnished room, one morning in October of 1962, and I said out loud what I really believe today is the first honest prayer that I ever said in my life. And it was simply, my God, my God, get me out of here. Uh, and I, I, I meant get me out of myself, get me out of this trap of this life I'm living. Uh, I felt that there were only two kinds of days. There were anxiety days and depression days. And I preferred depression days. Uh, I picked up the paper, and there was an ad for a job uh, in Huntington, and uh, the agency was in Hicksville, and I drove over to the agency, and the only way I could deal with being interviewed at an agency was to work up a good mad at agency people before I got there, you know, and say to myself, don't be afraid of these people, they're all too stupid to get a good job themselves anyhow, and, and if I could work up that attitude, you know, then I wasn't afraid of them. And uh, I got through that interview, and they made an appointment for the afternoon for me in Huntington. And I went home, and the people who owned the house in which the furnished room was, these lovely people, they were not wealthy people, but uh, they needed the money from the furnished room. But they, uh, they had a lovely family, and they asked me to have lunch with them. And I couldn't have lunch with them, because I had to have, there was a half a pint of vodka in there and some milk down. And I have a can of tuna fish, and that's what I had for lunch. And I had to drink that vodka in order to go on the interview. I had two dresses left, a brown one with a cigarette hole and a black one with a split seam, and I opted for the brown one. Uh, I had a cashmere coat that I had worn in a women's ad club ball. It was October. I put that over the, the, the cigarette hole, you know. And uh, I had a car that was in the same state of disrepair that I was. He sprayed ether on the carburetor of this car to start it in the summer. And uh, I sprayed the ether on the carburetor and jumped in the car, and away I went. Um, I got there, and there was a woman in the reception room, and I signed in, and she said, I'm terribly sorry, but the man who was to interview me was in a meeting, and I had to wait an hour for the interview. And I couldn't take the cashmere coat off. 
because of the cigarette hole. And the sun was coming through the glass as it does in late October as it sets. And the sweat was starting to pour out of me from the vodka. And in the hour that I waited many times, I thought that I would bolt. Uh, and in the hour that I waited, uh, this woman, whose name was Dorothy, uh, observed me. She smelled my breath when I signed the register. What I did not know was that Dorothy was two months sober in alcohol and uh, I got the job. I'm convinced the only reason I got the job was because the man kept me waiting for an hour and he was embarrassed. Uh, the company was owned by the patients who at that time owned the New York Mets who were losing, you know, beyond anything. So you can see the company got me and this woman didn't have anything going for it. Uh, and uh, this receptionist became my friend. Now, I thought she was going to drink with me. I just I smelled her out as a drinker, you know, and I said, she's going to know where everybody goes to drink, you know, and she's going to know what bars these people go to and so on. But we'd, a bunch of us would go to lunch together, and uh, she wouldn't drink, you know, and I couldn't figure it. But she was friendly with me. And uh, sometimes she'd, she'd say to me, my father was in the nursing home, and she'd say, here, why don't you take five dollars? Go up to Howard Johnson's, have your supper, and get your father some of that candy and go in and see him. And she did a lot of nice things for me. Like I would call in to say I wasn't coming in, and I might still be drunk from the night before. And she'd get me off the phone and wait until my boss had a phone call and hung up, and she'd ring in and say, oh, Betty called while you were on the phone. You know, she ran interference for me. She covered for me. Uh, and finally one day, uh, she suggested <laughs> that I needed, my hair needed attention. And why didn't I go for a permanent? She was getting one the next morning. That my hair needed attention was the understatement of the year. And, uh, but anyhow, I agreed. I said, I don't have any money. She said, I'll lend you the money. Come on, meet me tomorrow morning, 8 o'clock. She made the point. Well, in those days, they hooked you up to those wired things for permanence, you know. Eight o'clock in the morning, and the sweat coming out of you. And I almost died. I mean, with the frizzed hair and the beet red face. And uh, she invited me home to her house for lunch. And she started to tell me the story. And uh, uh, someone had taken me to a meeting about nine months before. A friend of mine that I grew up with, the one who wanted to go to the beach, ended up in AA, and uh, I passed it off. But I asked her, I said, tell me, do you, uh, uh, how did you stay sober? And she, of course, then told me she was in AA, she and her husband. And she told me this story, and I started to shake. I literally started to shake before it. And she went downstairs and got a bottle. She said, Bill doesn't know this is still down here. And she gave me a couple of drinks, and she gave me the bottle to take home. And she said, you think about it. And if you want to go with us next Thursday night or next Monday night, it was next Monday night, whichever. She said, "You come with us." And uh, the day came, and I decided to go. Um, it was a Thursday night, and uh, I remember that we went to supper in the diner, and I ordered a beer because I had a great bee hangover. It really wasn't the worst one I ever had. And uh, there was an insurance salesman who came with us. He paid the bill. I remember that. He had nothing to do with the story. But, uh, <laughs> but uh, somewhere along the line, it was said, do you want another cup of coffee? And I said, no, but I'd like another beer. And Dorothy said, why don't you try going to this meeting sober? And I said, this is ridiculous, two beers and not sober. But I didn't have it, and I've never had it, and that was uh, April 25, 1963, and for that I'm uh, eternally grateful. Uh, they took me to the meeting. It was, uh, it was in Manhasset, and Manhasset is on the north shore of Long Island, and there were Cadillacs in the parking lot, and the women had alligator shoes and pocketbooks that matched, and their hair was done. And someone came up to me and said, my dear, are you a new member? And I was not going to sign anything because I hadn't made up my mind yet. So I stood my full height and I said to her, I'm considering. <laughs> so she said, she said, darling, step right up front. We have a special role for considerers. And uh, by some miracle, uh, there were speakers from New York City that night. 
Um, the man later, many years later, when I moved back into New York City, I, I saw the man around a little. And uh, he was a very attractive man, uh, tall Irishman, gray-haired Irishman. And there was a woman who was probably in her late 40s uh, who had my story, literally. She told my story. Uh, and she, uh, she talked about going into a liquor store and walking up and down in front of the wine rack and computing in her head the bottle that had the highest alcohol content for the least money, and then taking it up to the counter and saying to the man, is this the right wine or chicken? And I had done the same thing, you know, like the week before. Uh, also, she talked about the fact that this man, whose name was Jim Hewitt, it's his name to me, that this man had uh, called her up at 3 o'clock in the afternoon and asked her uh, to go to this meeting with him and to have dinner with him on the way. And that didn't seem like a bad gig to me at all, you know. And I thought, how could she look like that when she only knew that she was going to go out at 3 o'clock in the afternoon, you know. Her hair was done. Her clothes looked perfect. She just looked wonderful. And I, literally, it was a little bit of, I'd like a life like that, you know. And she had had business success now, and she had lost jobs and so on. They took me home, and Dorothy said, are you going to drink tonight? Well, I didn't have any money because it was Thursday. I said, no. But I thought, I'll drink tomorrow night, and I'll think it over. Uh, Friday came, and there was a bill collector who called, and he had a judgment. And I knew that if I didn't send him almost my whole salary on Friday, that I was going to be out of work because he could affect the judgment. And I'd already been told that I was the boss would fire me if that happened. And so I said, I think I'll try it. And I went home, stayed home for the entire weekend, realized I had to go into work without booze Monday morning, without having had any booze. And I called New York City in a group Sunday night, and the people from Huntington came and took me to a meeting. Now that began for me what has been an entirely uh, new and wonderful life. Because literally, the way I felt when I came to AA was I, I was 34, about to be 35 years old. And uh, I didn't know how to do life. I mean, I just couldn't figure it out. I couldn't figure out how people got a salary and put money aside and had any fun. Uh, I just didn't understand any of this. And, uh, and, I, and I was paying my rent here now by the week, you know. And uh, that was, uh, it was $90 a month, and I could not put $90 together. I had to give the man $19.20 a week, uh, because I got paid by the week, and what was left, I drank and bought some food. Um, I went to the meeting, and I met uh, a great group of women. It seemed to me that most of them were four foot nine, but that was all right. I had a sponsor who was about that big. And she gave orders like a whack army sergeant, you know. They would say there aren't any musts in AA, but there are a lot of you better. Or well, you got it. Uh, and uh, they, they said a meeting every night. At first I didn't want to do it, and then I couldn't wait for meeting time. And they came around and they, and they, and they honked the horn, and I jumped in the car with, you know, some new AAs. And I firmly convinced if there's anybody here who's just beginning their AA life, this is going to be the greatest year of your life. Uh, it certainly was the greatest year of my life because new ideas were coming into my head all the time. I couldn't go to sleep when I got home. I was just high on the idea, maybe this will work for me. Maybe it'll work for me. And as that feeling grew and grew inside of me, just from going to meetings and hearing stories and beginning to identify, I started to believe, as it says in the second step, maybe it can work for me. If it works for them, maybe it can work for me. And I think that's the most important thing that happens in AA. Uh, I, I've, I've, seen, I've seen it over and over again in Northport, there on Long Island. Later, I moved back to New York City, seen it there. Most recently, I was in Florida on vacation. I went to a, a women's meeting at 10 o'clock on a Saturday morning. There were 13 women around the table, and two of them, it was their first meeting. And I saw the tears coming down this woman's face, but you could see the hope. The, 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 the fire was lit, and I know that woman was going to make it, because they kept telling, each person kept telling her, they came to AA, and they thought maybe it would work for them. 
uh, this sponsor came around, and they literally, they taught me things. My mother, who was needed to keep me a child, never taught me. I mean, I learned how to cook from women in AA. I learned how to decorate an apartment from women in AA. I learned how to reestablish credit, open a bank account, take care of budget my money. I learned all this stuff. Now, they didn't have to teach me, but they did. Uh, and, and it seems that at the time that I came in, uh, they hadn't had anyone come around that got sober in a long time. And they decided that I looked serious. And I'm telling you that I couldn't do anything and get away with it. I used to go back to Manhattan on Monday nights. And the reason I went back was there was a little money around there in Manhattan. And the men took all the women out for ice cream sodas after the meeting. And this was heaven for me. So every Monday night I'd go back. And I would tell them that here back in Huntington and Northport, where I was going, they wanted me to give up those pills. They said that those pills were no good. The Manhattan people were very smart. They said, well, are you drinking? And I said, no. And they just said, well, don't drink and go to meetings. And finally one day, uh, having listened long enough and gotten sober enough, I let go of the pills and turned them over. And I believe today that I wouldn't be standing here sober had I not been able to do that. Uh, for me, that was where it was at, because the pills were the same thing as the alcohol for me. I had become my own doctor, and I probably would have killed myself with them uh, before too long. But it was when I did that that I was fully able to take the second step. And I remember the day without a pill or a drink that I was able to serve coffee in a conference room. It was very exciting. Um, after I was sober about three or four weeks, uh, the people on the job came to me, and, and they had given me an envelope when I went to work there that had a couple hundred dollars in it. And they said, we have a raffle every payday, which was every other payday, I guess it was, whatever it was. And then somebody won so much money, and the rest of the money went in this envelope, which I was supposed to keep. And then when somebody had a baby, or they got married, or they left, I bought the present. Well, this committee, the employee committee, decided that money should be in a bank account. And you see, I didn't have it at all because I, I had uh, dipped into the pill a little. You know, I had to have a tooth out once and the dentist and the bottle. And you know how it goes. I stayed home to figure out how much I owed it. Uh, it was $100. I couldn't, couldn't have gotten $100 from anybody then any more than I could get 100000 tonight. Um, I took that. Two days off, three days. I drove out to Jones Beach. I remember it was in May. It was this time of year. And uh, I prayed. All I knew was I sat and watched the water, and I said, God, please show me how to get out of this. I know I don't want to drink. And something happened inside of me, and I turned around, and I drove home, and I went upstairs. Now, uh, about two hours later, there was a knock on the door, and there was this woman I had met at a meeting. I didn't have a phone, so uh, that had been taken in. And she came up and said, I thought you'd like to go to the house at the meeting. And maybe we can stop and I, I go to dinner at Howard Johnson. And we talked a while. And um, she said to me, you know, I got a raise today. And I'm going to make believe I didn't get it until next month. And I'm going to give you my raise. And I want you to do whatever you need. Well, I knew if I went back to work on Friday that I could take $60 in my pay in there. Survive on the remainder. And in the envelope was forty dollars. And um I have never looked back. I mean I asked God to show me the way and he did. Uh, my higher power was smart enough not to give me forty five. Because forty five help with the real food. And I was able to bring uh following that meeting, which in itself was a harm, with people from all over the world. I was able to go to Ireland to the home of my grandparents and see the things I heard about at my grandmother's knee. And this was a lifetime dream come true that I never, ever believed uh, would happen. And I had a roots experience there. The Irish delegate invited me to his home with his mother and his Aunt Eileen and his sister and her husband and the kids. And I went to the, into that house and sat down and at the table and I felt as if I'd come home. And I had a wonderful time, uh, wonderful, wonderful experience. Uh, more recently, I was able to buy an apartment six years ago in Brooklyn and uh, own my own home and uh, 
go through the business when I was over 50 years old of signing a mortgage, you know, as terrified as I was. Uh, and I found that uh, all the help I needed was there for me. Uh, um, other people were doing this in Manhattan. Uh, you almost have to do it now in Manhattan in order to have any fun. But it treated me very well financially. And, uh, and I have to not get too involved in that. But not a night goes by that I put out the lights. My apartment looks on the, uh, out on the South Harbor, uh, New York's South Harbor, and I see the ship coming in. And at night, the lights are magic. And every single night when I sit there, I said, I thank God for uh, the life that I live and what's been given to me. Uh, difficult things have happened to me in society. My father died right after I got sick. But the support I got through that in a way was incredible. Uh, more recently, in, in, in the early, right after the International Convention in New Orleans, I became aware that there was something terribly wrong with my legs and my feet. And uh, I knew that I wasn't going to be, it was getting worse and worse. And I was going to New York doctors who were saying weird things like, you had five feet, and then they charged me $150. I knew I had five feet when I went to kindergarten, you know. And, um, and, uh, finally one doctor diagnosed it, uh, and, and, uh, but he wanted me to choose which operation, because the New York doctors are very afraid of malpractice. And, uh, the right person was there, the podiatrist from Brooklyn Heights, who said, don't have enough to eat. Wait, wait, wait. And he helped me with a sonic to walk until, uh, through an AA friend in Minneapolis, I got a phone call from an orthopedic surgeon in AA. He said, I have heard a lecture by a man in the Mayo Clinic who said the most experience with what's wrong with you. I want you to come out. And I went. And this man who was a past delegate from Minneapolis came, drove 85 miles, and after I'd had all the tests and everything, they said, to make up my mind, and if I stay, they'd operate on Monday. And I made up my mind, and this man took me to his home, shared his family, his group, his... I was in the arms of AA, and there's six round trips to the Mayor Clinic. And I'm walking today, uh, and I'm well, and I'm able to walk a long distance. Uh, my experience with the higher power has been long and varied, my experience with the other stuff. I came to AA with a resentment against the Catholic Church. I tried to go back in early sobriety out of fear, and it lasted very briefly. And I went, um, Emma Talk helped me with the 11th step tremendously, um, because the concept of, uh, of the indwelling Christ, uh, was one I could understand because God's love came to me through you. And, and I believe sincerely that God is just, uh, within each of us. And it's uh, our permitting God to express His love to, uh, uh, through us to one another is how this works. Uh, but I did, in the last year, uh, when I was recovering from the second operation, a young man came into our group, young man, about 40, but that's young to me. Uh, and he, uh, he needed money, and he would rent his car to people, and he would work as a dispatcher for a guy who had a business, and do different things. So finally, I said, Phil, I'm taking a cab to work in this staff. Why don't you? And we, we've developed a friendship uh, where uh, he would drive me to work, and I would keep his spirits up all the way to work, giving him programs. You're going to find the right job, and you're doing the right thing. So, and, of course, by the time I got to work, my spirits were up, because dragging this cab around for six months was no day at the beach, you know. So, uh, but that's how I kept my spirits up. And my friendship with Bill has gone on to be uh, one where every time I help him, he helps me, and every time he helps it's it's really a very spiritual relationship. And a year ago, Easter, he took me to the church where he was in, uh, which is a Catholic church in our community. And, uh, and I'm back now by choice, uh, and I'm back now with my own understanding of the higher power in, in, a, in a Catholic community that... Uh, does many things. We, we shelter the homeless, and uh, and we do a, a lot of things that I believe in. And uh, uh, I was at a wedding there last Saturday, and Father Jim said we're pilgrims in this town. And uh, I think his community is about one third of the And uh, so here again, Bill has has given me, and uh, uh, this is why I believe that I have to do the twelve step. I have to keep on going to AA meetings. Uh, and being involved 
one day at a time. A lot of, you know, when you're 22 years sober, you can get pretty lonely at AM meetings in New York insofar as people who are sober the same as the time. Uh, and, and I have to work hard at not, uh, inviting them to put me on a pedestal. Because I have learned that the guy sitting next to me with seven months of variety can tell me something about the seven steps that I never thought of. Uh, and that I, that I must keep an open mind in this way. And I must, uh, permit myself to be present at the miracles that go on in AA day after day, night after night. We are going to be 40,000 strong in Montreal. Uh, the last registration figure is 32,000. Uh, so that tells you the kind of miracles that have gone on in the last five years. And, uh, there are more and more chairs filled in Brooklyn Heights, and I know there are more and more chairs filled in North Carolina because uh, this God-given program works for all of us. And I thank you all very, very much for letting us know you tonight. Thank you. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.